Hi, I'm John Taylor from Devoted Golfer TV here with Rob Neal of Biodynamics. Uh, Rob, I wonder if you could start out by telling us how uh, you, you're able to measure uh, wrist rotation and uh, different uh, translational movements of the wrist. Well, let's just go and, and do a, a little bit of background uh, anatomy physiology here. So the wrist has essentially two degrees of freedom. It has the ability to flex and extend, mm -hmm. and it has the ability to rotate around this axis to ulna and radially deviate. Mm -hmm. That's the only two degrees of freedom at the wrist joint. Mm -hmm. The third degree of freedom that people talk about, rotational, is supination and pronation. But that's really occurring up here between the radius and the ulna. So mm -hmm. the radius is rotating about a joint up here approximately. So this part of the wrist and hand don't move independently. They're moving as one segment here. So only two degrees of freedom, these two. Mm -hmm. And we measure those. So by putting a sensor on the, on the arm, I know what the arm is doing. By putting a sensor on the hand, I can model what the hand does. And then I can create a virtual segment, which is the forearm, because these two joints only have two degrees of freedom. The elbow joint only has flexion and extension, actually. It doesn't have, you, you, you can't move the elbow <laughs> right. this way. It only has one degree of freedom. So it, it just happens that because of those constraints at the joints, we don't need to put a sensor on the forearm to measure the uh, supination and pronation, and then we can also then calculate the flexion, extension, ulnar and radial deviations. And the, the, the strong message that I'd like to give to people is that when we measure these rotations in three-dimensional space, that unlike 2D, these rotations are not independent of, e of each other. So when you get a combination of pronation, ulna, deviation, you'll get a change in the flexion extension reading that you get to measure these joint motion, this joint motion. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to completely understand the graphs that are occurring out of these 3D systems in terms of the movements of these joints here. Because you might do this and feel like you didn't change the flexion extension at the joint. But in fact, if you measure it, you'll find that it may not be independent. In fact, there'll be changes in flexion extension, even though you found, I just kept this exactly straight. Or if you do manage to keep the, the um, uh, flexion extension value at, at zero while you only deviate, you may have actually induced a supination at the forearm in order for that to happen. So um, I think that we have to be very, very careful when looking at those lead and trail wrist rotations to be sure that we completely understand the motion that's going on there. And it, it, it matters very much how well the calibration is done on the, the orientation of the coordinate systems that you um, create in the different segments. So small digitizing errors in creating the coordinate systems have a marked influence then on the values that you would get for your radial ulna deviation, your flexion extension, your supination pronation values. You think about the hand as having a coordinate system attached to it and an origin, a point. We know where that point is relative to a global coordinate system. We know where the elbow joint center is relative to a global coordinate system. So it's very easy to know where this is moving relative to this. And then coupled with that, you have the rotations that are occurring at the joint, which is movement of the hand relative to the forearm. Do you also put, place a sensor on the club? Yes, we do. Yep. So you're able to digitize the club relative to the uh, forearm? And 
Yes. As a segment. Mm -hmm. so it, you it's considered just another segment in the right. chain now, yeah. Right. And you define the orientation of the face and, and um, the, an axis along the shaft. One of the assumptions that we make is that the, the shaft is rigid, mm -hmm. so there's no bending occurring during a swing. It's not a perfect assumption, particularly in high-speed swings, but when you look at pitching data or putting, there's virtually no um, bending of the shaft, so it's a good assumption in those situations. Another area that's uh, particularly interesting to me is uh, how, what the contribution of the spine might be in terms of generating power or the rotational contribution to the, the swing. There's discussion in the literature about how much uh, that, that occurs, and there's teaching that would argue Perhaps you should have a, a more uh, straight spine angle. But when you look at golfers swinging, the spine doesn't seem rigid at all. It seems quite dynamic. It is quite dynamic. And I think that the um, notion of a single spine angle, mm -hmm. or even you know, a spine angle as you look from 2D down the line versus from 2D in, uh, from face on, you'd see that the, the, even there that people do not maintain a rigid spine angle. So it's a, what I'd call a zeroth order approximation. <laughs> so qualitatively, it's a good concept. In reality, that's not what happens. The, the, the spine is v quite flexible, so it can bend and twist mm -hmm. and tilt. And I think part of it is that we have a relatively rigid body downstairs, the pelvis at yeah. the base of the spine. We model the upper part of the thorax also as another rigid body. And it's like a, a, a bit like a slinky in between. If we think of the joint between those two, it's a flexible coiled uh, object that allows this to happen. And, but, if, if we look at the spine angle concept, mm -hmm. just notionally, it seems that if we could keep the rotational velocity around a, 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 an axial component, so along the spine, that would be better than allowing too much tilting and bending to occur between the two segments. Um, and I think that probably uh, that idea has brings stability into the swing, but also has implications for injury. So that mm -hmm. when you have a, a pelvis that's moving up and a, an upper torso that's tilting to the right, you get a lot of, lot of compression on one side of the spine. So that we know is not good for the spine and could lead to injury, uh, particularly if you hit enough golf shots using a technique like that. So the, the um, uh, idea of minimizing but not uh, eliminating the tilting and, and bending during the swing is probably a good thing for spine health mm -hmm. rather than necessarily from a pure mechanical perspective. You raise an interesting thought about stability. Is it possible to go too far with stability training that would actually impede or, or uh, affect uh, rotational power in some way? I, I don't think you could go too far with it, but what you need to do is, is overlay movement patterns on top of the stability. Mm -hmm. So just because I give you more stability or give you more flexibility doesn't mean that you will use it in your golf swing mm -hmm. because you have a, a pattern of movement that you, you have developed over years and a certain feel for the, the movement that you're going to create. So part of the whole physical training spectrum would be to start and develop stability. And stability doesn't mean to me just being stationary. It mm -hmm. means having good control and being able to balance well as you're moving. So you develop stability and mobility, mm -hmm. flexibility. Then you want strength to um, layer on top of that. And then speed, which the combination of those two is power. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate goal in your training would be not just to stick to the stability mobility end of the spectrum, 
but to gain sufficient mobility and stability so that you could progress your training to the strength and power ends of the, of the training spectrum. And then you always need to be training the neural system to use that physical, attrib the physical attributes that you're training. So developing the correct movement patterns. So just getting strong, if you don't coordinate the movement well, doesn't give you greater club head speed. We're in an era of rapid change in our ability to do 3D motion capture. There seems to be a tremendous emphasis at the moment about developing something for uh, mobile devices where people can mm -hmm. look at their swing almost instantaneously and they're doing great software work there. I think that the technology is really um, pushing those boundaries uh, well. But at the end of the day, you don't teach yourself how to play golf. Mm -hmm. You still need input from experts because I could do all of the measurements myself. If I don't really know what I'm trying to get as, as the right combination of measurements or how I go about changing something, then uh, I don't know that I'm any better off than not knowing those numbers and, and uh, trying to develop the swing and just basing it on, oh, what's the ball doing? Because the, the, the thing that I have learned is that we aren't very good coaches of ourselves. And even the best players in the world rely on the eyes of coaches to help them stay on track with what they're doing. And so I think the technology can help the coaches in their decision making. It has the potential to help players as well. But I still think we need the combination of learning, uh, which is teacher and student, to have that um, really um, become embedded in a movement pattern. How would golfers learn about their swing mechanics using your biodynamics? I want to make sure that those people who invest in golf biodynamics have sufficient knowledge and expertise that, so that they can make an impact with their students and not feel like they wasted their money buying this technology. So we go through pretty rigorous training programs with our uh, licensees and they continually update their knowledge and work with us on that front. So that makes it slow to go into the market but it ensures that anyone who goes to these people gets a good service and that to me is a very important uh, part of the business. Well it must be working because everyone who has your system or who has been through the analysis has a lot of enthusiasm for what they've learned and I think that's a credit to how great the system yeah, is. Thank you very much John. Well Rob it's been a pleasure to uh, meet My you pleasure. And, and talk to you and thank you so much for visiting us. Thank you.